From the dawn of time, cardiac arrest has been a huge problem. Firstly, when does death actually occur? I'm not dead! Later on, we devised methods that were appropriate for that age to try and treat the patient in cardiac arrest. It wasn't until the mid-1940s that we actually were able to define and identify ventricular fibrillation and actually do something about it. And that brought us the first internal defibrillation. The 1960s brought external defibrillation out to the public. And since then, there has been a fast and ever-changing amount of treatments and modalities. But do any of these treatments work? Do they work in the way that we use them? And what does the future hold for the treatment of cardiac arrest? This will be part of our discussion when we address cardiac arrest, cracking the code. Hello and welcome to this afternoon's discussion on out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Uh, before we start, I'd like to mention some particular people that have started using our videos for their students. The UVA Pre-Hospital Education Program recently joined uh, our video group and are having their students use these as part of their education. There are several other groups that have been using them since the start that I think are worthy of mention. The Rappahannock EMS Council, the Thomas Jefferson EMS Council, the Virginia Association of Rescue Squads, District 10, and also our partner, clinicalbraintraining.com and fire-slash-emsbraintraining.com. So for this afternoon's discussion, I'd like to introduce to you our two guests. Dr. Bill Brady is a professor of both emergency medicine and medicine. He also holds the chair of the University of Virginia's Resuscitation Committee. Dr. Michael Curros is currently an assistant professor in the emergency department at VCU, where he oversees the STEMI program in their chest pain center. So Dr. Brady, to start off, an amazing decade, dynamic, lots of changes, probably the most notable of which is the AHA's new guidelines, with the new emphasis on continuous CPR with very, very little interruption. Um, they've been out a while. People have had a chance to, to use them, get used to them. How are we doing? Are we doing any way well, or have we missed it altogether? Yeah, with the reordering of the alphabet from the old-fashioned ABC to the CABs, resuscitation rates are better when the guidelines are followed and when providers do what they're supposed to do. That's where we really fall flat on our, our faces in the pre-hospital setting and in the hospital setting in terms of chest compressions, uninterrupted, high quality, push hard, deep, and fast, and don't stop. And that actually rarely happens in cardiac arrest management. I, I think probably one of the things, and we all see this, whether it be in, in a hospital or an out-of-hospital thing, uh, people tend to get focused on particular tasks. Uh, there's nobody there to sort of take the 30,000-foot view. Um, Dr. Kurz, do you think there's anything particularly that we could do to try and mitigate those problems, any new practices or procedures or, or ways of just going about managing the cardiac arrest that would help? Bill's point is very well taken. Every five years, the American Heart Association undergoes an enormous rigorous process to update the guidelines to make sure that they reflect the best and most recent science when we attempt to resuscitate a patient. This science then has to be translated into practice, and that's where the critical gap is. That critical gap was, in fact, acknowledged in the guidelines this year as for the first time we had an entire chapter devoted to the education of training and translating the guidelines into practice. This gap is highlighted in the ROC consortium. Uh, this study uh, shows that there was a 400-day lag between the announcement of the 2010 guidelines and their implementation. The ROC study arguably is the pinnacle of EMS and shows an enormous amount of variability in, in the implementation of those guidelines. It's this variability that fundamentally undermines our ability to improve the survival of outer hospital cardiac arrest. Can you, for those who have never heard of this uh, ROC study, can you give it a, a rough, brief rundown on what it actually was all about? Tom, the ROC trial stands for Resuscitations Outcomes Consortium. And that's exactly what it is. It's a consortium of 10 sites in the US and Canada funded by the NIH. These sites are, are varied, uh, different population compositions, different uh, metropolitan sizes, et cetera. And they also represent uh, different EMS agencies. Some are fire-based, some are hospital-based, um, some are uh, third-party public utility models. 
All of that aside, the goal of the Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium is as the title uh, suggests. It is to forward the progress in the science of resuscitation. They do so by evaluating uh, both types of resuscitation, um, cardiac arrest resuscitation as we're discussing today, and traumatic resuscitation. One of the things I think over the years as I, I've been watching these arrests, like I say, in the hospital or outside the hospital, um, is probably a lack of supervision, like I said earlier on. Do you think we need to fundamentally change how we do this where in an EMS environment, out of hospital, there needs to be, if at all possible, one person calling the shots, for, for want of a better word. Um, tiny differences, we looked at this in the department where I work, and if you looked at the small little gaps you had and the cumulative amount of time from those tiny little gaps, you were at minutes that nothing actually of any use was being done to the patient. Um, humans get tired. You know, the CPR is taught, but I, I probably dare to say that it's not taught equally or performed equally by different subsets of people. And we have a lot of devices that have come out now, and one of their great claim to fame is, you know, this will be consistent CPR done along the guidelines, and basically it won't have human error. Dr. Bray, do you, do you think there's a use for these mechanical devices? Are, are they, generally speaking, a good thing? So the mechanical CPR devices, I think, produce um, awesome CPR. They push hard, deep, and fast, and they don't stop. They don't stop until their, their drive, whether it be electrical or pneumatic, runs out. They produce so effective chest compressions that you can actually see patients open their eyes when they're in cardiac arrest, meaning that their brain is being perfused quite, quite adequately. Um, and yet, the outcomes are, are equivocal. You know, they're not astoundingly positive, which is somewhat surprising to a lot of us because we put so much emphasis on chest compressions and how important chest compressions are. How come a device that produces awesome chest compressions and doesn't fatigue doesn't produce equally awesome outcomes? The, I think the data is not massive in terms of the amount to be able to answer this question. Uh, Mike, do you have any thoughts on that? Bill, as you described, there is clearly a gap in what we believe mechanical CPR should do. And that gap comes in the outcomes. If the device provides outstanding CPR, we emphasize the CPR as the single most important thing that we can do during resuscitation, and this device provides outstanding CPR, then, then where are the overwhelming uh, changes in outcome? And, and as you suggest, they just aren't there. Um, there's been a significant amount of controversy around this topic for uh, a long period of time. If you go back, uh, just as an example, if you go back to the original uh, Autopulse trials that were published, um, you can see in the literature uh, uh, against each other, about face, in, in the same journal article, um, a prospective trial that was stopped for futility because it showed that the mechanical device did, did nothing um, and may have been harmful, abutted against a retrospective trial done in Richmond, Virginia, which showed clear benefit. There was then uh, some authors following that, that publication that suggested that the trial, the prospective trial, had been stopped for futility and had been stopped inappropriately for, fu for futility. Um, this sent essentially everyone in this realm back to the drawing board, and we came up with the follow the retrospect excuse me the prospective trial that has recently been published the CERC trial, and it suggests kind of no better no worse that mechanical CPR simply is about as good as really good manual CPR. Now that being said the mechanical devices have some benefits, and those benefits come from the human factors that it, does, it doesn't have to overcome. Specifically, that manual CPR providers, they get tired, and when they get tired, the quality of CPR that they provide over that period of time degrades. Also, the mechanical devices provide the same type of CPR consistently, independent of the environment, independent of uh, the motion in the back of the ambulance, independent of the patient, and so they can be reliable throughout the entire arrest when the quality of that CPR really matters. And I think probably to add to that there, around here probably you'll see that autopulse and you'll see uh, the Lucas device being used. 
that originally, I believe, started off in pneumatic power and is now converted over to the UC. You can use electricity with it as well. But if you were to take, and looking, as I said, that, that standing back view, looking in and seeing all these gaps, and you were to weigh that, knowing these trials, knowing the, you know, the pros and cons of everything, I'd ask both of you, would you rather on your patients rely on manual CPR or a compression device? Tom, I have to admit my own bias uh, in this regard. Uh, so I have a mechanical device, I have the autopulse device deployed not only throughout my entire institution, the hospital in which I work, but throughout the you know, EMS agency in Richmond. And so almost literally, you cannot arrest um, in the city of Richmond without having this device applied to you. Now, that being said, I will anecdotally tell you I see many, many more ROSCs than I ever did in three years of training in, in Chicago. Now, uh, achieving ROSC is significantly easier with the response times we have in Richmond than we ever had in Chicago. And quite frankly, um, it's easier to uh, get a pulse back when the person has only been down five minutes than they've been down 15 minutes. However, um, if I was pushed to choose one or the other, if it were for me or for a loved one, I, I think I would, um, I would defer to a mechanical device for all the benefits that we spoke about earlier. It, it doesn't tire, the CPR is always consistent, um, and it's at least as good as the manual CPR that can be provided. If, if you look at an urban environment, a suburban environment, a rural environment, and the type of personnel providers are going to respond, you certainly more likely than not are going to have more personnel on the scene of an arrest in an urban suburban environment, fire EMS working together. In a more rural environment or distant suburban area, you may have a crew with two people initially. True. And it's very difficult to do adequate appropriate CPR, defibrillate, and address all the other priorities in a resuscitation correctly. A manual CPR device, particularly in a personnel resource limited environment, I think is quite helpful and um, should be encouraged. We, we use those in several of the systems I work with where we have sometimes just two or three people responding to a cardiac arrest. So I think they're quite helpful in that setting. I think in an urban or suburban environment, I'm still going to encourage the use of these devices because they produce awesome CPR. And as you referred to a couple trials uh, a couple minutes back, you know, a trial, an investigation, a study, when you're comparing it to manually performed CPR, I would politely suggest that the manual CPR in those trials was being performed better than typical CPR. Oh, ab oh absolutely. In run-of-the-mill cardiac arrest management. So absolutely. It, and almost it's, you know, it's a, it's a it, the studies are correct and appropriate, but it's almost an unfair comparison Fair. just because CPR, particularly chest compressions, aren't going to be that awesome in most settings. Right. And Bill, that's exactly right. When you look at unmonitored studies of CPR, studies where the providers have no idea they're being watched or, or measured, that's exactly the case. Out of hospital, and that's true in hospital, yes. compressions aren't done effectively in terms of depth. They're not done appropriately in terms of rate. Yes. And interruptions are, people stop for so many things now, it's a wonder anybody gets any chest compressions during cardiac arrest, Tom. And I think that that's, one of the things that the new guidelines really, really honed in on, they, they try to simplify the things that we know work for the patient. There, there are some things that are out of our control, downtime, pre-existing conditions. We can't do anything about that. But they try to minimize this extraneous, um, for example, the, the focus for many, many years on advanced life support techniques and what have you. And they really hone down and try to drill in this very, very good CPR with minimal interruptions. So if we are to have minimal interruptions, Dr. Kurz, um, is there any science behind not stopping CPR to actually defibrillate the patient? For I mean, for many, many years, this has been verboten, and you'd never touch a patient. And there's all sorts of anecdotal stories about people getting shot. Um, but seems to be anecdotal stories. Is there any research going on right now that would say we could continue CPR, meet the goal of the AHA, and actually defibrillate at the same time? Tom, 
there is some literature that exists that suggests that we may be on the cusp of eliminating pauses in, in CPR in order to shock, and, and in fact, eliminating all hands-off time. Um, there's really two reasons in w for which we take our hands off the chest to interrupt CPR. The first is to determine the underlying rhythm, mostly because uh, you either shock or, or don't shock that underlying rhythm. And the second is for provider safety, the idea that uh, if a provider is in contact with the patient at the time the shock is delivered, that shock can somehow be delivered to that responder. If you look at the, the first reason we stopped, to look at the underlying rhythm, there is a significant amount of electrical engineering literature and signal processing uh, literature that suggests that, in fact, a computer can be built, an algorithm can be built to filter out the CPR noise uh, seen on the monitor when uh, doing resuscitation so that that can be stripped away and you can see the underlying rhythm without interrupting the CPR. That underlying rhythm then, assuming it is ventricular fibrillation, can be analyzed a second time using computer algorithms to determine when the best time to shock is. So you can imagine a scenario where this technology is incorporated into the monitor and while the providers do CPR, the monitor simply then uh, suggests or notifies the responders when is the most appropriate time to shock based on the underlying rhythm. The other issue why we, we take our hands off the chest when we're ready to shock is for, for provider safety. Um, in this realm, the literature gets uh, a, little, uh, a little hazier. However, there is some theoretical and demonstrative evidence that suggests that in the modern era uh, of using patches uh, in order to defibrillate for monitors rather than the old school paddles where um, you might still see on TV, um, that when you use the patches and the providers providing CPR are in fact uh, using body sub substance isolation, that there may be a very small, if any, risk to the providers that the electricity from the patches would be conducted across to the providers. So based on the knowledge uh, that you have so far of the studies, would you say it's a safe practice to do? Tom, I don't think I would run out and endorse hands-on defibrillation just yet. And, and frankly, I haven't done it in my own agency. Um, the literature that I cited, these are in fact pilot studies where uh, the providers are wearing gloves that we use as body substance isolation, either nitrile or latex or, or, or some other substance. And, and quite frankly, these gloves are in no way uh, measured or, or have been studied for the amount of electricity that conducted across them. They have not been studied in the varied environments in which uh, we're called upon to provide CPR. We have no idea what happens in terms of electrical conductivity, for example, when they might be wet. And frankly, um, since we haven't had that testing, we don't know how many shocks that these gloves may provide uh, protection for. It may be all of the shocks, it may be only one or two. Um, until there can be some uh, further uh, elucidation of, of, of how protective uh, the gloves that we routinely use for body substance isolation are for hands-on defibrillation, I'm not sure that we can endorse it quite yet. So probably a good idea, but not Quite ready to not pull, quite, pull not, the trigger quite now yes. and, and endorse it broadly and say, let's yes. do it. Tom, if I had enough vision to see how we would be resuscitating patients in the future, I think we'd be doing it with a two device system. The first device would be very similar to the mechanical CPR devices that we have now. It would provide continuous, consistent compressions. That device would be coupled with a second device that would largely resemble uh, our current monitor defibrillator with a couple exceptions. This new monitor defibrillator device would have technology incorporated into it that would be able to look through the signal processing uh, coming from the patient during CPR, and as I suggested earlier, um, eliminate all the noise from CPR to identify the underlying rhythm, and then from that underlying rhythm, determine when it is most advantageous to shock. The neat part about this two device system and what would bring it all together is the ability for both devices to communicate. Once the new monitor defibrillator had determined when it was most advantageous to shock, it could time that signal uh, or coordinate that signal with the compression device 
to shock on the upstroke when we know that as the heart fills during CPR, if we can shock at that precise moment, there's a significant advantage in, ter advent advantage in terms of ROSC. Uh, you know, that, that device, I agree, is probably what? At least five, if not seven to 10 years down the road? Probably. So, you know, I think today, you know, to answer your question, is it ready for prime time to recommend that providers continue compressions while defibrillation occurs using today's existing devices? As you say, there's a couple um, case series out there where this is done, um, mostly in controlled EP lab settings, so kind of simulating cardiac arrest management. Those are very suggestive that it's in fact safe and appropriate. And if you actually look at the urban myth of, hey, I knew this guy once who fell over dead when he was doing CPR and he, you know, he was touching the patient's big toe and, and, and he just died when the guy got shocked. If you actually look at the reports of rescuers that are injured by these, these rescuers somehow get their hands under the old-fashioned paddles, paddles yeah. mm -hmm. and are directly in line with the flow of or current. Or touch some conductive media somewhere else. So it, it does in fact happen but it happens when someone is directly in line with the current, not necessarily doing chest compressions. When you don't do what you were meant to be doing. Exactly. And then there's the whole concept of the rescue blanket. I don't know if you have much faith in that. It's basically an insulating blanket. That It's a small blanket type structure that you place on the patient's chest and you have your pads affixed to the patient and you're doing compressions through the pad with the idea that it insulates. And that certainly can allow you to do that, uh, to, to remain in contact with the patient while defibrillation is occurring. I've actually done it twice, the first time by accident and the second time intentional. And in neither case did I f perceive any shock. I didn't fall over dead and my hair did not frizz or curl. So in keeping basically with the, the new order of CAB, um, we'd like to talk a little bit about airway. And Dr. Brady, if you could give me your thoughts, I mean, for many, many years, uh, people were taught to bag patients using airway adjuncts, and frankly, to be honest with you, like, like we've seen in compressions, um, bagging is a lost art, and frankly, most people don't do it particularly well. Um, it causes an awful lot of problems the way they do it. But there's some literature and some science out now to say that actually just passive oxygenation during cardiac arrest a non-rebreather in, in London, I know there's some documentation that they actually put a nasal cannula on these patients at a higher flow than we would normally be used to and find that these patients do not dramatically desaturate. What's the theory? Why is that happening? Well, you know, the majority of people with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest are going to have a cardiac-based cardiac arrest. Early in the event, after arrival of the rescue team, they need to focus on compressions and recognizing and shocking shockable rhythms. Airway management in the old days, start bag valve mask and intubate as soon as possible. We've moved very far away from that for a lot of reasons. Um, I think one of the most important reasons is that coming back to what we've already mentioned that chest compressions and shocking shockable rhythms are very important keys. And managing the airway early on isn't that important itself and I think even more importantly the time and attention that a rescuer will provide to early airway management takes away from their ability yeah. to, to perform awesome chest compressions that their mothers would be proud of and shocking shockable rhythms. So it's really kind of a two-sided issue here. Early airway management probably isn't needed in the cardiac based cardiac arrest and the attention that's taken from the therapies that make a difference. There's a number of studies out there. The guidelines speak to it. And some of these studies actually go way beyond the guidelines of putting a oral airway in and 100% face mask on the dead guy and doing chest compressions. How does a person oxygenate there? First of all, early in arrest, they probably don't need oxygen because their oxygen debt isn't great. Secondly, there is some bulk movement of gas in and out because of the bellows effect of the chest compression. So there is some movement of, of oxygen in and out. Whether that truly is beneficial or not really hasn't been proven conclusively. But early in a cardiac-based cardiac arrest, which is the majority of what out-of-hospital providers are going to manage, I would not focus on the airway. Now, if you're managing a patient that has some issue 
severe dyspnea, possible PE, they were in florid pulmonary edema, they have a pneumothorax, you need to manage the airway earlier in those cases, but those are exceptions, and they're hard to identify when you've known the patient for 38 seconds and have no one to give you any history. But if you can recognize the exceptions, for example, in the PEA arrest patient, patients that have treatable causes of PEA do markedly better than non-PEA patients without a treatable cause. So if you can recognize it and manage it with the airway, that can make a difference, but that's hard to do. Well, I'll ask you, Dr. Kurz, the, there's a fi there has to be a finite time here, and this is all fine if you're um, maybe practicing in Charlottesville or Richmond in an area where ambulance to house is, is relatively short. There has to come a point where when there's an unknown downtime, you get to these people quite a while after they go down, is this going to work just as well if they have the reserve that you speak of? There comes a point where that reserve has to go away. So would it be fair to say that in an urban setting, this passive oxygenation, whether it be a mask or a cannula or whatever it is, is better suited to that suburban maybe area than it is out here where we may be multiple minutes away from any given home in a rural area? Um, it may. But I still, uh, as a medical director, I still don't think I would make the exchange that Bill describes, right? So when you look at the literature, if, if you start ABC, when, when the, the providers go for the airway, that typically delays, on average, the, the movement on to compressions by two minutes. Okay? That's two minutes in the ensuing beginning of the resuscitation. That's probably the two most valuable minutes you're going to get. Um, if you reverse the order, as we did with the new guidelines, right, and you start with compressions, on average, that delays the intervention of the airway, or at least in the studies at 2010 when, when the guidelines are written, by 18 seconds. That's an easy exchange for me to make all day. And even in a rural environment, I would not, unless, like, like Bill says, there's a clearly identifiable respiratory cause. Um, uh, in the garden variety, cardiac arrest, playing the numbers, I would still, independent of how long the response time is, guess that it's cardiac in nature, unless there's some obvious reason that it's not. In which case, if that's the etiology that I'm going with, I would still uh, maintain the emphasis on quality compressions and identifying a shockable rhythm before I move on to airway. Yeah, it, it would appear intuitive to me that if... Um, our emphasis is on compressing the chest and knowing that having a shockable rhythm that is indeed shocked is probably the biggest window to survival people have. And you're talking that there was a two-minute interval. There are plenty of people that that window of opportunity is firmly slammed closed for them by taking that extra two minutes to mess around at the head of the patient not prepare that heart with some CPR, still have a shockable rhythm left, and give them a chance by shocking them. So I, I, I think it's been hard for people to do that and grasp. There's been a fairly steep learning curve, I think, with these, with these new guidelines. Uh, one of the other things that I'm asked a lot and is a huge bone of contention. Um, you know, years ago, if you were to dare to deliver a, a patient to the hospital in cardiac arrest in the days when we did actually transport people in arrest. Um, you were nearly looked on as some form of a second class provider if the patient came in and was not intubated. Um, why are we so adamant now, and maybe I might put to you that the way it should be is that intubation is reserved for ROSC and not performed during the compressive stage of the resuscitation. Is that, is that a reasonable thing, Dr. Braden? The people that are going to respond to cardiac arrest management with return of spontaneous circulation are the patients typically that have a shortened downtime, have bystander compressions of some sort, have early defibrillation either prior to EMS arrival by a bystander using an AED or early EMS response. Those are the people that are going to likely survive with a intact or near intact functional status. Providing an invasive airway really at any time during an arrest is not wrong to do. 
Okay? But it is wrong to provide an invasive airway early, middle, or late in arrest management if it impacts the basic therapies that make a difference. Shocking shockable rhythms, performing awesome chest compressions that are high quality and uninterrupted. I have no problem if a provider intubates a patient at 30 seconds into the event, but at the same time, awesome chest compressions and attention to rhythm and shocking shockable rhythms as soon as they're noted, that needs to occur. So people need to understand that providing an airway isn't a bad thing, but providing an airway where it negatively impacts your ability to do the two things that do make a difference, shock shockable rhythms as soon as possible and perform awesome chest compressions. That's the key thing there. So I don't have a problem with somebody providing an airway as long as it doesn't impact those things. And I think, and I agree with you 100% and the evidence supports you in every way, but let's be honest and talk about the elephant in the room here. We need to have, if we're going to set a goal, we need to have achievable goals and over it's nearly 30 years now of, of doing this, um, I'll be 100% honest with you, and this is not a fault of pre-hospital providers. I can include myself absolutely in this. And watching them in the hospitals, in small hospitals, in big hospitals, it ain't going to happen. They're not going to intubate these people without there being some delay. So if we're going to do that in that very delicate time when we should be compressing and shocking, would it be easier to just say, as medical directors, I don't want you to do this until you have a return of spontaneous circulation, period. So in the hands of an experienced provider with good judgment, I don't have any problem in saying what I said before. Shock, shockable rhythms, awesome chest compressions, and if you feel the airway needs to be managed invasively and you can do it without negatively impacting the two priorities we've mentioned, do it. But in other groups of providers that may not be as experienced, then yes, I think what you say is correct. The priorities are the two basics. Airway can occur secondarily. And, and you can do it that way. You can, in fact, with a crew of three or four people that know what they're doing and have good judgment and good skills, you can, in fact, address the two basic priorities of compression and shocking rhythms and still manage the airway invasively. But if you have to lose one of those, delay invasive airway management until much later in the resuscitation or even after return of the pulse. Yes. Okay. Um, a lot of talk about when we're talking about definitive airway and we seem to be defining definitive airway as endotracheal intubation. But there's also a lot of superglottic airways that are out there that uh, the guidelines and a lot of people actually just, just recommend using a superglottic airway. But there's some research out there to say that once thought as being to some degree that, you know, this, the Hail Mary, the salvation of everything, if you can't get them intubated and you have a problem, you just stick a superglottic airway in them. There's some evidence to say that maybe these airways are not as beneficial. Would you address that, Dr. Curtis? Yeah, so uh, there are, uh, there is some preclinical work that has uh, come to light in the last year that suggests um, in, uh, in animals that a superglottic airway, uh, while it maintains the airway just fine, the pressure used uh, in order to inflate the balloon in the, in the superglottic airway directly impacts flow uh, to the carotid arteries in the low flow state in, in cardiac arrest. So essentially, while it may maintain the airway, um, uh, what it does is occlude the carotids, and while the patient may uh, regain a pulse from the outstanding resuscitation, uh, the brain is essentially robbed of perfusion during the entire downtime or, or ischemic time until a pulse is reached. Uh, this is clearly uh, 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 not, benef not beneficial and, and absolutely undermines the the. the Goal, which is the whole purpose, right? The, right, the goal, which is neurologic outcome, you know, beneficial neurologic outcome. Um, um, a couple things about that that preclinical work. One, the preclinical work is done in pigs, um, and while pigs and and people are we're, we're all mammals, uh, the anatomy in the neck is a little different, um, and so uh, I'm not sure that it's completely. Um, transposable to, to humans. The, the work is not quite, 
don't think I'd hang my hat on it. Uh, number two, um, uh, there's a number of devices, uh, supraglottic airways, some um, that have been, uh, they've all been tested and they've been used in um, hospital settings, right, as a bailout airway for many, many years, and there's plenty of safety data behind them. Um, and so I don't think I would jump to not using a supraglottic airway. I think probably the most conservative and appropriate approach here is um, if you decide you're going to take an airway invasively, as Bill said, um, and that should never come at the expense of chest, quality chest compressions, or shocking a shockable rhythm, but if a provider decides that they need to invasively take an airway, um, that taking of the airway should be done with, I think, a first look policy. You take the one best, most optimized look that you're going to get with the, with the best provider to try to take it with a definitive airway. And if you still need to take that airway and you don't get it on the first go, you move to a supraglottic airway and you move on. Um, the last thing we want, and I'm sure that plenty of your viewers have seen, is um, a uh, difficult airway that then bogs down the entire resuscitation, um, in which point you lose the priorities, compressions, and shock rhythms, and the resuscitation spirals downward as it becomes focused on the airway, and the rest of the priorities are lost. And we so I think that's about time for us to take a break. Um, in the first part, we've obviously talked about some very important stuff, the new AHA guidelines, the steep curve there seems to have been in getting them implemented and used. Uh, we've talked about compression devices and whether they actually afford some benefit or not. Uh, useful of, usefulness of intubation, obviously, is a, is a hot topic. It's been around forever, and it seems that certainly we've established in everybody's opinion is that if it takes away time from compression and shocking of shockable rhythms, it's probably not the thing to do straight off. Uh, we've also talked about hands-on shocking, something that's not done right now, and they've both talked about some of the research that uh, says that probably in the lab setting right now it's safe, but not quite ready to come out into the EMS field. So in the second part, what we're going to talk about is, is probably the best stuff. We've saved the best till last. Uh, the future. What can we reasonably expect to see being done in cardiac arrest, and what can we see on our ambulance? A lot of research has been done about uh, pre-hospital ultrasound. Uh, we'll talk about whether or not that's something that's really realistic that you might see on every ambulance in the near future. Uh, we'll also talk about the use of the cath lab. Uh, if time is really muscle, should we, as well as talk the talk, walk the walk, so to speak, in patients that are stable with MIs, why are we delaying any time at all by going to the emergency department? Should those patients not be taken straight to the cath lab? So those are things that we'll get opinions from both Dr. Brady and Dr. Kurz on. And as I say, they're the future of what we're going to be doing in cardiac arrest. Uh, I hope you'll join us. It's probably going to be an interesting discussion. So join us for the second part. Thank you.